my name is Satya. Um, I'm currently a freshman at Liberty University, and I'm a current intern at Regnery Publishing. Um, I'm so honored to be given this opportunity to introduce the president of Regnery Publishing, Margie Ross. Um, as a current intern at Regnery, I've looked up to Margie because of her commitment to champion true conservative values. Margie embodies the characteristics of what a real conservative woman looks like. She fearlessly leads Regnery Publishing while never compromising on her values. Regnery has had numerous books placed on the New York Times bestsellers list and Publishers Weekly's bestsellers list, making the company's average bestsellers one of the best in the publishing industry. Margie has been the president of Regnery Publishing since 2003 and also serves on the boards of the National Conservative Campaign Fund, the Claire Booth Lou Center for Conservative Women, and the Beth Chai Congregation. She's a graduate of Dartmouth and the American University. Thank you, Margie, for everything you have done for the conservative movement and for being an inspiration to conservative women across the nation. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Margie Ross. The only problem with Satya being a freshman is it's going to be a long time before I can actually hire her to work at Regnery Publishing. Well, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yeah, good. Um, it's great to be with you today. Wonderful to see all of these wonderful young conservative leaders. Um, your stories are inspiring to me and to all of us. So thank you for everything you do. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit today about American exceptionalism. And um, some of the things I am going to say we've already talked about before, that's actually a good thing. Um, one of the best classes I ever had in college was a class that um, where we read an assignment every night, we came in and the professor talked about the exact same thing we had read and then we had homework talking yet again about the exact same thing we had read and talked about. And some people thought it was repetitive, but as a book publisher, I can tell you, people don't remember anything if they hear it only once. <laughs> they have to hear it three or four or five times um, before they really um, understand it and remember it. That's one of our principles of how we promote books. And, um, and so uh, I'm not even gonna apologize for having some things uh, repeated that we've heard already today. Um, as you heard, I run Regnery Publishing. I've been doing that for almost 20 years. Um, when I stepped um, into that role, I became the first person outside of the Regnery family to hold that title, um, which was a privilege, an honor, a big responsibility, and um, a great opportunity for me to work with some of the most uh, interesting, controversial, provocative, courageous, um, and compassionate uh, thought leaders and uh, celebrities in the conservative movement and uh, in the conservative world. Um, we have been publishing conservative books for over 70 years, started um, with some of the early works of the conservative movement. We <laughs> published William F. Buckley's God and Man at Yale, which was his first book. Um, fast forward 50 years, I actually worked with William F. Buckley on his last book, which was called Miles Gone By. Um, and we've worked with, as I said, all the conservative authors, pretty much everyone that, uh, that you've ever heard of. Um, Ann Coulter, Michelle Malkin, Laura Ingram, Mark Stein, Mark Levin, David Limbaugh, Dinesh D'Souza, Newt Gingrich, Sebastian Gorka, Dennis Prager, Eric Metaxas. Um, the list goes on and on. And, um, and because I am a book publisher, I actually am going to, um, some of my speech today will include some uh, passages, hopefully short, from uh, some, some of my favorite books. And at the end, I'm going to give you a little um, not a reading list, but a recommendation of some books that you might want to read to learn more about American exceptionalism because um, my goal is to equip you to answer the question, um, what makes America great? And, you know, I thought about wearing my MAGA hat. I do have one. And um, 
but but really, I want to uh, turn you guys into evangelists for American exceptionalism. And I'm going to talk about what it is, what it isn't, and how you can um, sort of defend and uh, champion what's great about America um, on your college campuses, with your friends, with your family, with anyone who um, challenges you on that, or anyone who wants to learn more about what that means. Um, but let me tell you first, I think I'm supposed to tell you about myself, right? So um, I'll tell you a little bit about um, what a book publisher does. And um, it's, uh, as I said, a great privilege for me to get to work with a lot of really interesting people. But some people don't really know what a book publisher is. And some people sort of think of a book publisher as a printer, um, as opposed to a publisher. But our job is to get ideas out, right? Our job is to work with thinkers, thought leaders, writers, commentators, media personalities, and help them spread their message more broadly than they otherwise could, reach people that they're not reaching yet. Um, so the job is just as much about how do we market their ideas, how do we spread their ideas, how do we explain to people why they should care about those ideas, um, as it is about, you know, editing words on a page, or printing words in a book, or making them available electronically as um, Kindles and eBooks or audiobooks. Um, I, I remember when, uh, about five years ago, when Amazon was soaring in terms of how many eBooks they were selling versus print books, and everyone thought, oh my god, it's the death of the book, and there aren't going to be any books left in America, and nobody's reading, and people would say to me, what, what are you going to do? You're not going to have a job. There are no books, and, um, and my response was, well, as long as people are reading, I don't I'm agnostic about what they, what format they want. They listen to an odd book on tape, great. If they read it on their Kindle or their iPad or their phone, great. Um, as long as people are reading, um, that's what's important to me because I think that um, there are a lot of arguments that can be conveyed um, in, a, in a tweet or in an op-ed or in a blog or a podcast, but there are some things that require a book, some things that you really need to understand and sort of delve into um, that will that require the length and, and uh, extent of argument that you can only do in a book. So I'm a, I'm a book champion. I'm, uh, I advocate for books. Um, sometimes people ask me, how do you get your kids to read? So I'll, you can just file this one away for later when you have kids. Um, uh, and I talk to young parents sometimes who say, I can't get my kids interested in books, that they don't like reading, especially young boys a lot of times don't like reading. Um, so my advice is always, if you want your kids to read, read. Read in front of them. Make reading fun. If kids love to model what their parents do. Even when they say they don't, they always do. So if you think reading is fun and a great adventure and important in your home and in your family and your life, your kids will too. So remember that. If you want your kids to read, just read. Um, and I also think that part of my job as a publisher, not to make it sound too grandiose, but is to try to make the world a better place. Books are incredibly influential in changing people's minds, in changing the course of history, um, in, and whether it changes one person or a million people. Um, books have a power that, are, that is sort of surprising, considering um, that it's a relatively small industry in terms of, of sales and, and business. But it, uh, it's a very important part of our the fabric of our society. And part of that is because um, books can touch way more people than the actual number of people who have literally bought and read that book. So when I talk to an author, I say, yes, you're going to reach 10,000 people, 100,000 people who will buy your book, but you're going to reach millions of people who hear about your book and see you on TV and hear you on the radio and read reviews of your books. So the power of books is, uh, is something that reaches way beyond um, just the number of copies that, uh, that we can sell. And to be, a, to be a really good publisher, for us as a current events political publisher, 
we all have to be news junkies. We have to be watching trends. We have to be, have kind of our finger on the pulse of what's going on so we can be relevant when we're publishing the books that we bring out. Um, and so I want to talk to you about how that led me to a speech on American exceptionalism because um, there are a few trends that, again, we've heard about already today. There, um, there are things that are either troubling or significant or both in our society, and I think um, they lead to this argument that we need to be able to defend what makes America exceptional. Um, one of them, one, one uh, trend that we've talked about and that I think is really important is this, um, this movement we've seen in our society, and you guys have all seen it, that has taken us from tolerance to forced endorsement, right? So it used to be enough just to say, look, we can agree to disagree. You have your opinion. I'll have mine. That's not good enough for the left anymore. They will not accept that you just agree to disagree. They will insist that you, um, that you endorse their progressive sort of agenda and narrative for the country and for the future of the world. Um, we published a book a few years ago. So this is the first one I'm going to recommend to you. It's called You Will Be Made to Care. It was a book by Eric Erickson, who is the editor of Red State. And um, it was pretty prophetic. He pu we published this in 2016. And it was about just this issue of it will soon no longer be good enough to just agree to disagree, to just be tolerant of other people's points of views that may differ from your own. Pretty soon, you're going to be made to care. And so I'll read you a little, little bit from that. Um, he's talking about a, uh, a guy named, what was his name, Michael Sam. And he was a football player, actually he was a college football player. And he came out and said he was gay. And supposedly he was like the first openly gay man to be, want to play in the NFL. And so um, when he announced he was gay, here we go, here's what Eric says. When Sam announced he was gay and intended to head to the NFL, the sports press insisted on getting other athletes on the record. Peyton Manning, who knows who Peyton Manning is? Peyton Manning, widely regarded as one of the nicest men in the NFL and a giant star quarterback, announced that nobody cared. You're drafted a football player, he said. That's all we care about in the locker room. What you do outside in your personal life is up to you. But that wasn't good enough. Gay rights activists attacked Manning for not being sufficiently happy that there was now a gay NFL player. The gay press wrote, but on the other hand, this nobody cares attitude may swing the pendulum a little too far in the other direction. It erases Michael Sam's queerness and is only a few steps away from we don't mind having gay people around as long as they don't talk about it. Here in the 21st century, it is not enough to be okay with the left's agenda. You must celebrate and approve. You must care about it sufficiently or suffer the consequences. That's, that's a significant problem. That's, a, that's an issue that we talk about a lot. Um, and I encourage you to keep that in mind as you go back to your, um, your college campuses because it won't be enough to just say, hey, let's agree to disagree. Let's move on. You have to engage. And you have to be prepared to defend your point of view. We'll get back to that in a minute. Um, obviously, we've talked about how free speech is being shouted down on college campuses. We've talked about identity politics and how that's taken the place of the melting pot. Um, and this, both of these things are sort of distortions, I think, of what, um, of what America was founded on and, and sort of taking something good and, and perverting it off into a strange direction that becomes very anti-American. Um, and so where, to me, this all leads is to a, a, um, a trend that, that I am calling history shaming, where it's not OK to, any, to acknowledge um, the good things about American history. In fact, we need to erase history. We published a book last year actually called Erasing America. And, um, and I'll tell you a story about it because 
It's a story, uh, it's a personal story. So um, my husband is on the Planning and Zoning Commission in the county where we live. And um, he went to the courthouse for one of their meetings and they were having this big argument in the county courthouse because they had done a historic restoration of the building. It was like a hundred, over 100 years old, this beautiful county courthouse. And as they were restoring different parts of it, they found that the one of the beautiful old murals had the Ten Commandments. And so there's this big uproar about whether or not they could have the Ten Commandments, yep, up in the county courtroom. To which my husband, oh, and they said, we're afraid that, that someone is going to bring a lawsuit that a juror sitting in the courtroom will look up and see the Ten Commandments and be somehow swayed by them. Oh, no! <laughs> right? <laughs> and so they, they came up with a compromise, which is <laughs> they would keep the, uh, the, ten, the mural but they had these slider screens built so that when the court was in session, they would cover it up. Because, <laughs> you know, it might influence someone. My husband said, influence them, like, to do the right thing. <laughs> um, but but that, <laughs> those are the kinds of things that are going on all across this country. And so we have a whole, whole book on that. But the, the point really is um, we are in the process of or the left is in the process of trying to rewrite history, erase history, all with the agenda of saying, um, of sort of devaluing where we came from and what this country was founded on. Um, Kate uh, alluded to this at the end of her uh, presentation just a few minutes ago, um, how the amazing blessing of this country was um, that we were founded um, with the principle that we have rights that come from God. Revolutionary contract, concept um, and on which no other country had ever been founded in the history of mankind. And um, that's, that's the core of American exceptionalism, and, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what that means, what, how to handle people who criticize that, how to respond to some of the most common criticisms of that, and um, how to arm yourself to be a better um, evangelist for American exceptionalism. So, um, first of all, I'll lay out a few caveats, which is we're not perfect. That's often a, a good, you know, easy jab at America to say, well, think of all the terrible things that America has done. Um, I quote, um, I quote many things, um, but uh, probably the best quote comes from Romans chapter 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Of course, we're not perfect. No one ever said we're perfect. Um, my middle daughter once came to me and said, mom, um, you know, there are a lot of people who say I'm a perfectionist, but I don't think I I'm not a perfectionist because there are so many things I do that aren't perfect. <laughs> yeah, I know. That, <laughs> that's what that means. Um, so, of course, we are not perfect. There are many things that uh, we have as a country and each of us as individuals that we are not proud of, whether it's slavery, whether it's um, the uh, Japanese internment, whether it's you know 58 million unborn babies murdered since Roe v. Wade. There are many, many things that we, ways in which we have sinned and ways in which we ha are not perfect. Um, but, but, but to me, the point about American exceptionalism and one of the easiest mistakes that people make is um, we're not superior to other people by virtue of being born here. We're not better. We're lucky. That's the key. And when people say, well, you know, you just think you're so great. No, no, we're incredibly fortunate. And that is not um, just a blessing, it's a responsibility. So um, let me talk about a few of these attacks and the false narratives that people use to sort of say, well, American exceptionalism, pff, that's no big deal. In fact, that doesn't even exist. It's not really a thing. Um, and um, 
some of those definitions, false definitions of American exceptionalism are, are simply wrong, right? There are some definitions I've seen that are just, um, they're not really designed to attack America, they're just not correct. There are things like the frontier spirit, or the melting pot, or upward social mobility, or our role in spreading democracy. So my, let me be clear. Those aren't definitions of American exceptionalism. Those are the results of American exceptionalism. Those things happen because of how we are exceptional. They're fantastic things. They are the result of what makes us exceptional. Um, but more aggravating to me are definitions of American exceptionalism that are really meant as ways, subtle and not so subtle, to discredit America, right? To, um, so here's one. You may remember this one. I will again invoke Barack Obama. Um, when he said, yeah, every country is exceptional, right? I believe in America, he said, I believe in American exceptionalism, just as I suspect that the Brits believe in British Nash exceptionalism and the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism. So here's the fundamental problem with that. Here's why that's a fundamental misunderstanding of American exceptionalism. American exceptionalism isn't civic pride, right? It's not patriotism. It's not love of country. I love America because it is exceptional. It's not exceptional because I love it. And that's the, that's the key, right? Not all things that are loved are equally lovable. We've all had friends who loved terrible boyfriends. <laughs> the love might have been equal, but the boyfriends were not. <laughs> we have to be willing to say these two things are not equal. There, there is not a, you know, equivalency. The left always tries to do this. They're like, well, you know, of course the Palestinians are bombing Israel, but Israel's bombing them. It's okay, actually, to say there's a good guy and a bad guy. Sometimes things aren't equal. Um, and, and so don't fall for that one, right? Um, one of my, okay, I'm gonna read another, this is one of my favorite passages, and one of my favorite authors, Mark Stein. We did a book, we've done several books with him. This was the first book we did, it's called America Alone. And he has one of my favorite descriptions of the trap of um, moral equivalency between different cultures and this whole multiculturalism thing where we say, oh, we should just respect and honor other cultures. So if you want to wear a burqa, if you want to follow Sharia law, we're just honoring somebody else's culture. Here's what he has. Um, let's see. Where do I start here? Okay. In a culturally confident age, the British in India were faced with the practice of sati, the tradition of burning widows on the funeral pyres of their husbands. General Sir Charles Napier was impeccably multicultural. He said, you say that it is your custom to burn widows. Very well. We also have a custom. When men burn a woman alive, we tie a rope around their necks and we hang them. <laughs> Build your funeral pyre. Beside it, my carpenters will build a gallows. You may follow your custom, and then we will follow ours. Really powerful statement of the difference between some cultures and others. Um, there's a related criticism to American exceptionalism, and that it's that American exceptionalism is just sort of arrogant hubris. It's code for moral superiority, right? We think we're so great. Um, it's politically correct to, to mock that, to reject out of hand American greatness. Um, but as I said, does that mean we're not great? Does that mean we shouldn't be honoring the things that make us exceptional? Um, again, not because we're perfect. Certainly individuals have made some t mistakes. But is that because of our core values or despite them? 
Um, there are two criticisms I like to take together, um, take as a pair. You'll see why in a minute. One of them says, we're not exceptional because we're too powerful and we bully everybody else around the world. The other one says, we're not great because our power is declining and we no longer have a lot of influence around the world. So aside from the fact that that's ridiculous, you can't both be, can't be criticized for both being too powerful and not powerful enough, but the fact is again, neither one of those is true because they entirely miss the point, right? Our influence around the world is the result of our exceptional foundation, our exceptional core values. That's why people flock to come here. That's why every immigrant that you talk to said, I lived my life hoping and praying that I could move to America, the one place where I could be free, where I would have liberty. That's, so our influence is the result of the exceptionalism. It's not the exceptionalism itself. Um, another false description that critics like to lob is, um, just so they can shoot it down, is American exceptionalism is just an excuse to inflate our global role, right? Here's a quote I love. The United States is not an exceptional nation and is not entitled by virtue of history to play a role on the world stage different from other nations. Again, massively missing the point. I don't believe the founders thought we were entitled to play a special role. If anything, I think they thought we were obligated to play a role. It was our responsibility to play that role, a role for good. Um, one leftist theologian described American exceptionalism as this, right? The automatic assumption that America acts for the right. Well, of course, that's easy to disagree with. I don't think America always acts for the right, but that's not what American exceptionalism is, right? All right, so I told you a lot about what it's not. Let's talk about what it is. Um, I'll start with a, uh, a study that I found recently. And um, again, hearkening back to Kate's point about um, the feminists not being willing to criticize how oppressed women are in many other cultures, especially the Muslim culture, and how, um, and always focusing on the sort of intolerance here. Um, there was a study um, not long ago, two Swedish economists set out to examine um, whether economic freedom made people more or less racist. So they did this a map of the most and least racially tolerant countries in the world. Um, and they asked a lot of different questions, including a very interesting one, which is to gauge how you would feel about having a neighbor who is a different race from you, right? And so they had all kinds of ways of asking this question to get out of people, you know, basically how tolerant, racially tolerant, they were. So, you want to guess? <laughs> People in the survey were most likely to embrace a racially diverse neighbor. The United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, United Kingdom. And so, as we continue, this is a, a study you can cite, as we continue to hear the left talk about um, how bigoted, how racist this country is, um, again, not perfect, but better than all the other countries. <laughs> um, again, it's not a case of bragging, it's not a case of us, you know, thumping our chest and talking about how great we are. It is, it is really a sense of being willing to defend why um, this country is a beacon of hope for so many other people around the world and why it's worth defending and why it's really important to understand what makes us exceptional. So what is it? Um, we're not superior human beings because we were born here. It's not actually the individual people who are exceptional. Um, it is the ideals on which our country was based. It is the extent to which we live up to those ideals that we continue to be an exceptional nation. 
So um, we've quoted this before, but take a look at the Declaration of Independence, a remarkable document, um, and one that best captures, I think, our ideals. It was a letter to the world explaining why we felt justified to break from, from England. And in that letter, Thomas Jefferson expressed a unique and a revolutionary proposition. You know these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, humanity, are created equal, created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's it. That's what makes us exceptional. The fact that we are a country founded on the principle that our rights come from God, that we have rights to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, and that no man or power structure ha can take those away, has the right to take them away. And when a government or a group of people or an individual attempts to take that away, we must, not are we entitled, we must fight. Um, and someone earlier said um, that their dedication to the Second Amendment was that without the right to defend ourselves, um, all the other rights are impossible to defend. Um, that's what the founders knew. That's why it was in there. And, um, and this idea that those rights are inalienable and they come from a creator are, were ideas that no other government had ever been founded on. All other governments had been founded on, you know, the rights of monarchs and, and the rights of an oligarchy or an aristocracy or a group of humans to control what people had the right to do or not do, to say or not say, think or not think, own or not own, live or not live. Um, Many Regnery authors have talked about this concept, and um, I will read you one of my favorites. This is another book we published. Newt Gingrich wrote a book on American exceptionalism called A Nation Like No Other. And um, he has, um, I'll read you a couple things actually, because he tells a really wonderful story that I want to share. But first, he just explains this concept very well, I think. And he says, it's become fashionable among the liberal elite to downplay, deride, even deny America's greatness. The political correctness police insist that America is hated around the world for being too big, too powerful, too rich, too successful, too loud, too intrusive, and besides, it's not nice to brag. They are completely missing the point. America's greatness, America's exceptional greatness, is not based on the fact that we are the most powerful, most prosperous, and most generous nation anywhere on Earth. Rather, those things are the result of American exceptionalism. To understand American exceptionalism, one must understand our unique birth as a nation. American exceptionalism is found in the simple yet utterly remarkable principles expressed in the Declaration of Independence. As we heard, our nation is exceptional because we, unlike any nation before or since, are united by the belief and the promise that no king, no government, no ruling class has the power to infringe upon the rights of the individual. And when such a government attempts to do so, we will vigorously reject it. Now I want to read you another story that is uh, a really heartwarming story that I think um, personifies and sort of dramatizes what makes us exceptional. So he writes, um, sports columnist and author David Thomas chronicled a season of high school football. I, I, I love football. Sorry, I had to tell you that. So I have two football stories for you. Um, played by the grapevine faith Christian Lions. At one point during the season, coach Chris Hogan saw an opportunity to teach his team something much more important than how to win a football game. The Lions were preparing to play against Gainesville State, 
which was a maximum security juvenile detention facility, housing kids who had been convicted of everything from drugs to armed assault and whose parents had long ago disowned them. Every game played by the Gainesville State Tornadoes ended with uniformed officers escorting the players in their bus in groups of five handcuffed at the ready. So before the game, Coach Hogan sent an email asking his team and their friends and families to do something unusual. He asked for half the faith Christian fans to switch sides and to cheer for the other team's players by name. When asked by his own team members why he was making the surprising request, Hogan responded, imagine if you didn't have a home life. Imagine if everybody had pretty much given up on you. Now imagine what it would mean for hundreds of people to suddenly believe in you. Well, the Gainesville tornado soon learned. On game night, they entered the field to find a line of faith fans who were cheering for them. Confused at first, the Tornadoes soon realized that hundreds of faith fans and even cheerleaders were not mistakenly cheering for the wrong team. They had heard their own names being shouted from the stands. After that, they played better than they had played all season, and even though they still lost, they gave their head coach a sideline Gatorade shower as if they had just won the state championship. More important, they left the field that night forever changed. Following the game, both teams came together to pray. A Gainesville player in toad, Lord, I don't know how this happened, so I don't know how to say thank you, but I never would have known there were so many people in the world that cared about us. As the Gainesville coach left the field, he grabbed Hogan and said, you'll never know what your people did for these kids tonight. You'll never, ever know. Coach Hogan described the message he intended to send to the youth of Gainesville State that night. We love you. Jesus Christ loves you. You are just as valuable as any other person on planet Earth. That's the message of American exceptionalism, that every life, every human being is just as valuable as every other person on Earth. Um, so I will take some questions. We're going to wrap up with, I'm sorry, a reading list. But um, because the way to be an evangelist for American exceptionalism is A, to understand what makes us exceptional, um, and then to arm yourself with more ways to express what that is. Um, we've taught, one of my favorite ways to describe what I believe in, um, what I believe we are in the midst of a fight about in this country, I believe ultimately the fight we are having is between, as Mark Levin quite aptly put it in the title of his book, a fight between liberty and tyranny. Um, this country's exceptional founding is all about liberty. And unfortunately, I believe the left, the progressive radical left's agenda leads to tyranny. Every single time in human history, we have chosen tyranny over liberty. The results have been very, very bad, ugly, and unhappy for people, for all people. Um, I, so my first suggestion of a book to read is Mark Levin's Liberty and Tyranny. I suggest you read Newt Gingrich's book, the one I just mentioned, A Nation Like No Other. I suggest you read Eric Erickson's book, You Will Be Made to Care. I suggest you read Jordan Peterson's book. How many people have read 12 Rules for Life? <laughs> it's actually um, interesting. Canadian professor of psychology or psychiatry um, writing ultimately um, some very profound and simple common sense lessons about what um, about our values, I think, as Americans. Um, and, uh, you know, if you want to go scholarly, read de Tocqueville, Democracy in America, read the Federalist Papers, which do a really good job. Um, but um, lastly, I'll harken back to what I said about reading. If you want your kids to read and to love reading, read. Um, if you want people to understand and appreciate American exceptionalism, model it. Honor the things that make us exceptional. Faith, um, 
compassion, liberty, uh, family, and um, the true belief that um, our rights cannot be taken by anyone, are given to us by God, and are worth defending at all costs. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? I'll talk about it. <laughs> Which one? Hello. Uh, Hello. Well, I really loved everything you had to say. <laughs> Thank um, you. Because just two days ago, I was in one of my ethics classes, and we were talking about income inequality, and everybody was just totally down on America. Yep. And um, I said something, and I said that our country is incredibly generous. And everyone, except for two people in the room, like laughed and scoffed at me and all this stuff. And I was just like, no, right. really? Yeah. <laughs> and, it's very uh, easy to back that up. I yeah. mean, if you look at, um, you know, how much money, how, w the budget of the UN, the percentage of the budget of the UN that's funded by America versus all other countries. If you look at all of the big, um, NGOs, you know, whether it's the World Bank or USAID or any of these big charitable organizations, um, yeah, the the charity from America dwarfs by a, a ridiculous amount all other countries. Um, quick Google search, and you can find some really good statistics on that. Sure. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Um, hi. Uh, hi. Thank you for coming to talk to us today. Sure. Uh, my question kind of pertains to patriotism as well as American exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. um, it's been said by various conservative thinkers that uh, one of the reasons why we're so polarized today politically is because many people on the left aren't proud to be American. Um, so with the idea of patriotism and American exceptionalism, how do we promote the, our, pri our pride in our country and our pride right. to be American to those on the left? I think that's a great question. I think um, the, I, perhaps overly hopeful, but I actually think that there are a lot more people who are not proud of being American because they're uninformed. I think they actually don't know. I think they've been misled as to things like, you know, our generosity, our support for humanitarian things around the world, the the wage gap. There, you know, there's been such a giant brainwashing by the mainstream media and social media that I think um, you can almost forgive people for saying, well, gosh, I, I, I don't know if we're that good anymore. I, I feel bad. So, I, I mean, I think the first step is education and really sharing with people, well, did you know this? Did you know that actually, you know, America gives more money to, you know, third world countries, to the African continent, to, you know, pick your place that needs help than, you know, all of these other countries combined. You can, you can, you know, mar and so rather than going for the big picture, we're great. You can take, I think, little examples and um, and share that with people. I think people, I think more people. There's there's definitely a radical left progressive fringe that you're never going to convince because they don't want to be convinced. I think there's a much bigger group of people who actually would be pleasantly surprised to find out how wonderful we are. They might be really reassured to know, actually, we do all these wonderful things. We do, the, we, we are trying, we are progressive, we are, you know, and comparing what, what we've accomplished and what, you know, the opportunities that are um, open to people here as opposed to everywhere else in the world, I think people might actually be happy to learn that that is true. Um, I also think one of the best ways for people to appreciate this country is to leave it. You know, whenever you travel, I mean, I hear this all the time, and you may have experienced this or heard other people. Travel to, as soon as you travel to another country, oh boy, do you appreciate <laughs> 
what you have here. And, and I think there are a surprising number of people, I'll give you one more example, there are a surprising number of people who don't realize that the First Amendment doesn't actually exist in the rest of the world. I've heard people who say, oh, well, you know, you can't say, you can say that in Germany because, you know, freedom of speech. Uh, what? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Little history lesson, right? <laughs> They don't run by the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights. That's not their governing document. And um, so I think people, are, first step, education, giving examples, helping people feel a happy pride about, about, uh, about this country. That's what I would say. Okay. Sorry, am I done? Yes, done. <laughs> Thank you.